The leaders of the Nordic countries are holding their annual meeting in Iceland, and Prime Minister Trudeau has been invited as a special guest. This is the Prime Minister boarding the plane to Iceland, which has now landed uh, in Iceland, uh, and he is there to uh, talk about a variety of issues that uh, affect both Canada and other Nordic countries and try and increase the collaboration uh, between those countries and this country. Of course, other things, global issues like the war in Ukraine, climate change on the agenda. So to talk about all of that and more, joining me, the Prime Minister of Iceland, Katrin Jakobsdottir. Nice to see you, uh, Prime Minister. Appreciate you doing this. Nice to see you too. Perhaps we can start with uh, you telling me why Prime Minister Trudeau was invited to the Nordic Prime Minister's meeting uh, today. As you know, he, he just arrived. What, uh, what are you hoping will come of this, uh, of this uh, meeting with him? Well, obviously, the Nordic countries and Canada have a lot of common interests. The Arctic springs first to the mind where we have a very close collaboration. Uh, obviously, also, the war in Ukraine has required a great solidarity, not just among the European countries, but also with the US and Canada, within NATO. So we are going to talk about security and, and, and peace uh, at our meeting here in Iceland. And then we are going to talk, obviously, about several other things that I think these countries actually have shared goals. Uh, I could talk about climate and biodiversity, for one thing, but also yeah. other <clears throat> important issues like societal resilience in uh, times where we are faced with grave challenges, all of us. Well, uh, well, uh, let's go to the war in Ukraine and then come back to a couple of those topics, mm -hmm. if that's okay, because it has been um, a, a pretty incredible couple of days in Russia um, with the yes. this uprising that has now uh, been calmed to some extent. What did you make of that mm -hmm. power struggle, uh, and what do you think that that does to Vladimir Putin? Mm -hmm. Well, it's very difficult to judge, really, what exactly is happening in Russia. And obviously, uh, information coming from Russia is uh, all built on a very sound base. But I think it was, we followed, of course, the situation very closely. We are going to use some time in our meeting to, to talk about that. Yeah. But I think it shows, uh, obviously, that there is growing internal conflict in Russia. And do you think that that... Um could benefit Ukraine and NATO countries, for that matter, who are supporting Ukraine? Well, one doesn't really know what will uh, <clears throat> what will happen next and, and what powers really are uh, dealing with each other there in Russia. Because as I said, information is, is not exactly built on, on all we are seeing in media. It's, it's based really on, on what their little information there is. Mm -hmm. But I think, uh, Obviously, we are seeing the rise of an internal conflict, and even though now the situation has been de-escalated, I think it's it's not likely that it's that we've seen the end of it. We will see some continuation of this. Iceland is the only NATO country without a uh, an army, a military presence. You, you do lots of other things in terms of defending your borders with the coast guards yeah. and, and that kind of thing. Uh, in in light of the war in Ukraine. It, is there a conversation to be had about creating a permanent military? And if not, why not? Well, uh, it's true what you say. We don't have a military of our own, but we've been members of uh, NATO ever since 1949. We also have a defense agreement with the US. Uh, and we have actually been increasing uh, spending on our infrastructure, on our societal infrastructure, on our infrastructure when it comes to cybersecurity, and uh, other types of civilian <clears throat> defense. So, so this has been our focus. And actually, it's been a relatively broad unity in Iceland that we think about security on this broad, from this very broad perspective. And, and uh, our, uh, we try to do our bit differently than mm -hmm. offer, uh, offer a military of our own. And we do this not just through uh, political stance and humanitarian stance, but also as I said, by strengthening our civilian defense. So, so the shift that we saw in both Finland, uh, who is now a part of uh, NATO, and, and Sweden, who is still trying to, to get there, the shift that we saw in terms of societal acceptance of being part of that alliance, it, that, that is not a conversation happening in Iceland in the same way, e even though you are part of NATO, I understand, but the, in terms of the military response. <clears throat> well, well, we have been members of NATO, as I said. We are, yeah. we are, we are founding members of NATO. Yeah. So yeah. obviously there is not the same shift uh, in Iceland. 
Uh, and we think really that we can ensure our security best in multilateral collaboration with the defense agreement and with a very strong participation in civilian uh, defenses. Uh, you, you, uh, you, you know that the, the big summit is coming up in Lithuania for NATO, and obviously yes. uh, Jens Stoltenberg has said that this target of two percent of GDP on defense spending probably needs to mm -hmm. go up. It probably needs to be increased. Uh, that is mm -hmm. obviously a political conversation in this country, as I'm sure you're aware. Uh, what is your view mm -hmm. on whether that target needs to be increased in order to respond to what we're seeing right now? Well, that, uh, that is obviously something rather difficult for Iceland to answer, not yeah. having a military of our own. So yeah. our actually, what we do is built on a different basis. Uh, but obviously, uh, security in our mind is built on this very broad perspective. Uh, so, so it's not just about military spending. It's also, as I said, about uh, societal resilience, uh, infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, what we are, for example, have been experiencing here in Iceland after the Russian invasion, at least during uh, our summit here of the Council, uh, of, the Council of Europe, is in increased internet uh, insecurity with cyber attacks here in Iceland. So, so this is what we have been focusing on. But obviously, uh, circumstances are very different between different countries uh, when it comes to the military spending. As of August 1st, uh, you have made the decision to suspend embassy operations in Moscow. You've also asked Russia yes. to scale back diplomatic activities in Reykjavik. Why are, yes. Can you explain why you're doing that, what, what you think that message that sends, and whether you think other countries need to consider it as well? <clears throat> well, uh, first and foremost, our embassy in Moscow is a very small operation. And, and right now, there hasn't, of course, been any political dialogue with Russia. There isn't any dialogue on trade or culture, which is the main focus of an embassy. So we thought, first and foremost, this is, uh, this is not the priority now to keep an embassy open in Moscow. But it also obviously sends a political message to Russia. And have they responded in terms of what they are going to do in Reykjavik? They have not responded yet, no. And and do you think that I, I, obviously this is a, you know a particular situation to Iceland, but do you think other countries should consider this, given that the the dialogue is largely non-existent for any country? This was uh, a decision that we made, and as I said, we have a very small operation in Moscow. We are a small country of three hundred ninety thousand people, so so uh, yeah. obviously circum circumstances can be different between different countries. This was our own decision, uh, and and I think every country just needs to uh, make their own decisions in this. Okay. Uh, but now but, my time is running out because I have to go and meet some prime ministers that yes, are coming. Let, let me ask you one last question on climate change before you go, okay. because obviously that is yeah. important, as you say, and, and a shared, I think, um, issue for, for Canada, certainly. What do you hope to see in, in relation to that conversation? Um, and how can you, as a leader in renewable energy in the world, kind of push other countries to, to reach their goals? Well, Iceland has done a lot of good things when it comes to renewable energy, but, but still we have a long way to go and we are not doing enough because what we're seeing is climate change uh, happening uh, at a very strong pace, uh, not least here in the Arctic where yeah. it's happening at a, a, a more <laughs> pace even. So we need to do more, not just when it comes to renewable energy, but really in every sector, uh, the circular economy is going to be a very important tool for all of our countries but we need to face the fact that we must accelerate uh, all our actions when it comes to climate to ensure really that we make a sufficient process. We are not getting, uh, as I said, we are not doing enough, not Iceland, and I really don't think uh, most of the countries in yeah. the world are not doing enough. Prime Minister Jakob Stotter, thank you for making the time. You've got a bunch of prime ministers to greet, so I'm not going to keep you longer. But you know that lots of lots <laughs> of Canadians, you. lots of Canadians love Iceland. So very kind of you to speak with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much, and we okay. love Canada too. It's <laughs> always a pleasure to be there. I know that I've been there. Good, good. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay, you so much. have a good summit. I appreciate it, Prime Minister. Nice to meet you.